Well, good morning again, church. Good morning. Good morning. Blessed day. Praise the Lord. If you would, go ahead, open your Bibles, go ahead and turn your Bibles to James chapter 2. We'll be concluding James chapter 2 today as we've made our way through James. James chapter 2, starting at verse number 14. Once you've found James 2, verse 14, we'll go ahead and stand again and we'll finish out James chapter 2, starting at verse number 14. Again, once you've found James 2, 14, please stand to honor the reading of God's holy word. James 2, starting at verse number 14. The word of the Lord says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save them? For if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it, is, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? For was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. And Father, as we move into this time of studying your scripture, we pray that the spirit today, your Holy Spirit, will open our minds and our eyes to your truth today, that your spirit will move ahead of the, of the sermon today and will plow up our hearts and minds to receive the seed of the gospel and that it may fall into good soil. And we ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So this section today in the scripture that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be examining, is probably one of the most debated and fought over sections of the New Testament. The battle in this section is over faith versus works. And the opponents, what they do is they actually divide into two basic camps. You have two camps. The first camp is a camp that we call legalism. The second camp is a camp that's called antinomianism. Now that's a big, long theological word. It just means no law. No law. So the first one is legalism. The second is antinomianism or no law. Legalism says that you must keep the entire law to be justified before God. You have to keep every single bit of it. You have to keep the law or you won't be justified. That's what legalism says. While antinomianism, again, no law, antinomianism says, no, Jesus is actually the justifier, so you don't have to keep the law at all because Jesus kept it. And therefore, no matter what you do or what you say, you will still be justified. And both of these views are actually deadly serious errors. Both legalism and antinomianism, these are deadly serious errors and we need to be aware of it because these two errors are still prevalent today in our culture and in a lot of churches today. In the two camps, what they do is they actually they want to justify what they believe and what they teach by dividing themselves into two more camps and that's the Apostles Paul and the Apostles James. Some say I'm going to follow Paul, some say I'm going to follow James. The Pauline camp, the ones who follow Paul, they would quote Romans 8.38. It says, Therefore we can or 8, 3, 28, excuse me. Therefore we conclude that man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. They'll say, see right there, Paul says that. Then therefore we conclude man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. And then again, Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Paul says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not 
by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And of course, then we can't forget Paul's words to the church in Ephesus, where he says in, Eph in Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, Paul, he sounds pretty clear there. Wouldn't you agree? He sounds pretty clear. That we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. And we would say amen to that. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. But we also know, we also know, as in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And since we now know that all Scripture is from God, how do we reconcile these seeming contradictions? And I say seeming contradictions because they're really not contradictions at all. But how do we reconcile these two? How do we do that? Martin Luther, many of you have heard of Martin Luther. He was the father of the Reformation. He actually despised the book of James. He actually wanted to rip out and omit the book of James. He said he just despised it. He could not stand it because of James' insistence on works. He said, no, we're saved by grace alone. Works has nothing to do with it. And so he actually, Martin Luther, wanted to get rid of James. He didn't like this book. But if James is, in fact, Scripture, which it is, we simply just cannot remove it. We, just, we can't simply remove it because we don't understand it. When we come to something that seems contradictory or something that we just can't quite wrap our minds around, the, the issue isn't with God's Word. The issue is with us. And remember James's instruction in chapter 1, verse 5. What did he say? If you have your Bibles, look at James 1, 5. He said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him do what? Let him ask of God. That's right. Let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally, without reproach, and it will be given to him. So if you come to something in Scripture that you just don't get, you can't wrap your mind around it, you can't understand it, don't just chunk it away and say, I'm just going to skip over it. Pray about it. The Bible says, ask God. If you need wisdom, ask God about it. Go to God in prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to help you understand. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to reveal to you, what is it you're trying to say here, Lord? What is it that you're trying to say? And so then we have to ask the question, were Paul and James really at odds with one another? Were they really at odds? Because again... Today, if you, if you look at the legalism camp and you look at the antinomianism, the no-law camp, you, you would think that they were constantly butting heads with each other. That they're contradictory messages. Is it really faith alone or is it also works? Are works included? Roman Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Mormons, they would have us believe that it's not faith alone by grace alone that saves they believe that you must do works also. You have to do works to be saved. That's why the Jehovah's Witnesses, that's why they come to your door. That's why the Mormons come to your door. They believe you have to do these things. You have to do works. It's not enough that Jesus suffered and died on a cross. And they'll actually they'll point to this section in James for justification of their doctrine. Roman Catholics will do the same. But then there are many in the Protestant denominations who will say, you know, that's, that's not right. That's not right. You, once you're saved, you're always saved. So you have this group that says, you know, Jesus, he, he died for your sins, but you still have to keep the law. You have to do all that you can to keep that salvation. But then you have this other group, a lot in the, in the Protestant denominations, I won't name them, but they'll say, once you're saved, you're always saved, and no matter what you say or do, you're still covered. You can do whatever you want to do. So it goes, some will even go as far to say that, that uh, believe that somebody who once professed faith at some point in their life, even maybe as a young child, and then they, at some point in their life, they actually walked away from the faith, and then they, they lived a life of complete rebellion, a life of complete rejection of God. They'll say that, you know, even though this person did that, they're still going to go to heaven because they said a prayer one time. But yet they lived the life of a complete reprobate. They, they had nothing to do with church. They hated God. They rejected God. But I said a prayer as a young child, so I'm saved. Because they said the sinner's prayer. So you have one extreme. One extreme says that Jesus' sacrifice was not enough. We have to also strive to keep the law. We have to do good deeds to be saved. 
And then you have the other extreme on this side, because again, these are extreme beliefs that say that, yes, Jesus paid for your fine completely. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be saved. You can live your life however you want to live it. You can say whatever you want to say. You don't actually have to live a life of, of, of holiness, a life set apart, because you know what? You said this prayer once, and Jesus has got you covered. Even though there's never really been true repentance, there's been no turning from sin, there's been no life transformation, because if you did that stuff, that would be considered legalism, and we're completely free of God's law. That's what one group believes as well. And you'll see that. And you'll know that because you'll talk to people, and you'll see them saying and acting and doing things, and then you'll go, didn't they just say they were at church on Sunday, that they're, that they're a Christian? We get a lot of pushback in the streets from people when we're open air preaching. We'll have people that just come up to a staggering drunk. We'll hear them using all sorts of profanities. And they'll get up there and they'll splash their beard. Praise God, I'll be in church tomorrow. You think God's happy with that kind of thing, that kind of worship? No, of course he's not. But they believe that. You can't say I'm not saved. Blankety blank, blank, blank. They'll say But I'm here today to tell you that both of those camps, both of those camps, they're doctrinally false. And even though both camps will use Scripture to back up what they believe, they'll show you in Scripture. They'll say, but it just says here, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. So I'm saved. And then you'll have the other group. It says here, you have to have works. You have to do good deeds. You have to keep the law. You have to wear certain clothes, have your hair cut a certain way, avoid these, avoid that, and do this and do that, or you're not going to be saved. You have to add to it. But friends, these are doctrinally false, and they're actually what's called damnable heresies, if you hold to these things. And so we have to be, we have to be cautious with the Word of God. When we approach the Word of God, we have to handle it with the reverence that it so richly deserves. We have to be careful with what we do, with what we read. And then what we teach and what we tell people. Because there's eternal consequences for what you believe. Eternal consequences. And friends, eternity is a long time to be wrong. A long time. And so the question we have to always, always ask ourselves is this. What's more important? What I believe or if what I believe is true? That's the important question we have to believe. And so where do we find our foundation of truth? Does anybody know? Where do we find that foundation? You have this open today. This is where our foundation of truth comes from. We don't go by opinion. We don't go by emotion. We don't go by what the secular world says. We go by what the Word of God says. Because God knows. And He's given us His Word. If you would, hold your place in James and let's go backward to 2 Timothy. I already quoted part of this earlier, but I want to read the other half. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. So if you want to go backward, you go through uh, James, you go through Hebrews. And go backwards, keep going, you'll go through Philemon and Titus, and you'll come to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, looking at verse number 16. Amen when you're there. Amen. Amen. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 16. Look what it says. All, and if you have a pen, you're an underliner or a circler, I would circle all. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness. But let's not stop there. Let's continue. Look at verse number 17. Look what Paul continues to say. He says, he says that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every good work. So that kind of gives you pause. You say, now wait a minute. What did Paul just write right there? What did he say? We're equipped for every good what? Every good work. So could it be that the Apostle Paul is suggesting that we add works to our salvation? Could it be that's what he's saying? I don't think so. But you know, I find it interesting that with all of Paul's writings, all of Paul's writings, how he emphasizes faith apart from works. He emphasizes, if you read all his works, he's always talking about that. It's, 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 it's by grace alone through faith alone, not of works. That even though he, he writes this, you have James who wrote James's letter. Actually, he wrote James wrote his letter 44 to 49 AD, which means that James's letter was the first, the first of the New Testament scripture to be written. It was written first. And I say it's interesting because Paul knew James. 
How do we know that? We know it from the book of Acts. We also, if you remember when we studied Galatians, how Paul talked about that he, he talked with James, he knew James. And so James was the leader of the church at that time. He was in Jerusalem. And, and so Paul and James, they would have talked together. They would have studied the word together. They would have prayed together. They would have, they would have had meals. They would have shared meals together. They would have known each other very well. And as bold and straightforward and outspoken as Paul was, we don't find in any of Paul's writings where he rebukes James. We also don't see that he anywhere he tries to correct James's letter. So there has to be more than what we read at first glance. So let's turn back to James. Hopefully you held your place, James. Look at verses 14 and 17 of chapter 2 of James. What does he say? He says, What is it profit, my brethren, if somebody says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm, be filled, but you don't give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So here in this section, James is not saying that works will produce a living faith, but it's actually it's just the opposite. He's saying that faith will produce good works. If you have a true and living faith, you're going to produce works. You can't help it. That's what he's saying here. He, and then he gives us the example of the poor, naked, and hungry brother or sister. He's saying, you know what? Your words mean nothing by themselves. They mean nothing by themselves. If you don't act on your faith, you have to put flesh on your words. You have to put flesh on the bones. You have to actually put a walk to your talk. That's what he's trying to say. I gave you the example before, if you remember, about which one, which saved Noah. Was it Noah's belief and faith or was it Noah's actions? Which one saved Noah? His actions saved him, right? You know, if, if, if God appeared to Noah and he said, listen, Noah, I'm only going to be with humanity for another 120 years and then I'm going to wipe out all of humanity. All of creation is going to be destroyed. But I'm going to give you an opportunity, you and your family, because you've been righteous in my eyes. And so I need you to build this great, big, huge boat. And then I'm going to send all these animals to you. And you and your family will enter this boat, and you'll bring all the animals in with you, and you all will be saved. Because in 120 years, Noah, listen, I'm destroying the earth. And so God tells Noah this, and if he didn't believe, and he didn't build the ark. I mean, he could say, you know what? I absolutely, I believe you, Lord. I believe you 100%. I believe that you're going to do that. If he did not go out and he did not build the ark, what would have happened? He and his family and all of creation would have been destroyed. He would have been destroyed with the rest of humanity. So James isn't saying you're saved by, he's not saying you're saved by your works. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, but a true faith, a real faith, a genuine faith should produce obedience to God's commands. And that kind of faith, that kind of living faith should be evidenced by our works, by the way we talk, by the way we treat people, and by the things that we do. Again, hold your place in James. We're going backward to Matthew. We need to go, let's go and see what Jesus says about this. Matthew chapter 7. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Amen when you're there. We're going to be looking at verse 17, starting at verse 17. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 17. Amen. You're there. Amen. Amen. Now this is a very important thing. It ties into what we're saying, so I hope you're there. Matthew 7, starting at verse 17. Listen to what Jesus says. This is, again, this is part from that great Sermon on the Mount. He says this, Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. He says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? It's cut down. It's thrown into the fire. Therefore, he says, by their fruits, you will know them. He says, for not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many word wonders in your name? These are people who are professing Christians. We've looked at this many times. People who go to church, 
They sing in the choir. They do things. They tithe. They might go every single day. The door's open. These are professing Christians that are coming to him. And what does he say? I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And now, if you're in Matthew, fast forward to, to, to John. To John. You go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then we come to John. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Jesus is building on what he's saying. Because remember, he mentioned about fruit and trees. So Matthew chapter 15, starting at verse 1. Amen when you're there. All right, John 15. So look what he says. Verses 1 to 8. Jesus is saying, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what does he do? He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. For as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Notice what it says. If you're in Christ and he is truly in you, he says, you will bear much fruit. He says, for without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and it's withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me, if you do abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. He says, by this my Father is glorified. And what is it that the Father is glorified? That you bear much fruit. And so you will be my disciples. The fact that you're bearing fruit will be proof that you're his disciple, he says. And that he's truly living in you. And that you're living in him. That you're abiding together. You're connected. And so if you're a true born-again Christian, he says you will abide in Christ. And you will produce fruit. But did you notice the warning that Christ gave back in Matthew chapter 7? He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's that antinomianism we talked about. No law. The Christians who say, I can live my life however I want. I don't have to be holy. Jesus died for me, so now I can do whatever I want. If I want to cuss, if I want to, if I want to go out and get drunk and party, if I want to watch all these horrible movies and blasphemies, and I want to just say and do whatever I want to do, there's no proof, no fruit there at all. And these are the ones that Jesus is talking to. And they're all around us. You'll see them. And he says, you who practice lawlessness, no law. Those who bear no fruit, they show no signs of the new birth. Again, let's turn back to James. Back to James, chapter 2. James 2, 18 to 20. James continues, he says, But someone will say... You have faith. He says, but I have works. So show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God. You do well, he says. But even the demons believe and they actually tremble. But do you want to know, a foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So here James is saying that you can have all the, all the theological knowledge that you can possibly get. You can just cram your brain chock full of all the orthodox theological knowledge that you have. You can actually believe in the existence of God. A lot of people say that. I believe in God. That's why when I'm in the street and I ask, get into a spiritual conversation with somebody and I'm witnessing to them, they say, well, I believe in God. You need to press them. What God are you talking about? Because there's a lot of gods out there. So what God are you talking about? Should be Jesus, right? So you can, you can believe in the existence of God. You can actually believe that the Bible is the holy, inspired, infallible Word of God. You can even believe that Jesus is the Messiah. There will be many people you'll talk to. I believe, in Je I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You can believe in the atonement through His death, burial, and resurrection. I believe Jesus died. I believe that He was buried. I believe that He resurrected. You can even believe that, he's, that He ascended into heaven. After 40 days, and then today he sits at the right hand of the Father. You can believe all of that is true and still be just as lost as an unbeliever. It's not what we believe. It's what we do with what we believe that matters. Because again, as James observes, he says, you know what? 
Even the demons believe all that. The demons know all that's true. Do you not know that? Satan knows every single bit of this is true. But does that mean that he's saved? No. So he says even the demons believe. But he actually goes on to let us know they're actually smarter than we are because they actually tremble at the name of Jesus. When demons hear the name of Jesus, what do they do? Master, please don't, don't cast us away. What do people do nowadays when they hear Jesus? Oh, he's my homeboy. Oh yeah, he's my buddy. They just completely have his name irreverent that way. So demons are actually smarter than we are. And in this section, James, he, he's just trying to get us. He wants us to be 100% honest with ourselves. He's writing to the church. Not a specific church, but the church in general. And he's wanting us, the church, the body, the people, to be 100% honest with themselves. He's saying, does your walk match your talk? That's the name of this sermon series, Walk the Walk. Now, I can have all the knowledge to be completely orthodox in my belief. I could just read down through a list and check off everything. I believe that, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that. I could be completely orthodox in my belief, but if my actions and my words and my deeds, they don't align with my belief, then James is letting you and I know. He says, oh foolish man, that faith without works, it's dead. It's dead. It's not a real faith that you have. So hold your place again. I know we're getting our Bible workout, but turn back to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. It's something important I want you to see. It's all important, but James chap or Luke, chapter 3. Luke, chapter 3. Starting at verse number 7. While you're turning there, just to kind of let you know what's going on in this section of, Jane, of Luke, chapter 3. This is John the Baptist. He's preparing the way for Jesus. He's out in the wilderness. He's preaching. He's telling people to repent. He's as the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. This is John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. So Luke, chapter 3, verse number 7. Amen when you're there. Right there. Amen. All right, let's look and see. What's John say? He says, then he said, and speaking of John, to the multitudes that, that came out to be baptized by them. He said, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Wouldn't that be a great way to start a witnessing conversation? Somebody comes up to you, you give them a gospel tract, and you look at them and go, brood of vipers. But anyway, that's how he does. He says, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He says, therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourself we have Abraham as our father for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones and even now he says the axe is laid to the root of the trees and that should be frightening to hear the axe is laid to the root of the trees therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down is thrown into the fire and so then the people, they asked him, saying, What shall we do then? What shall we do? And he answered and he says to them, He who has two tunics, let him, it's a shirt, let him give to one who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. And then the tax collectors came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, What shall we do? And so he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely. Be content with your wages. I want you to notice here that John the Baptist, he's telling the crowd, they need to repent. They need to repent. But also notice that at the same time, he cuts in their, into their belief that just because they're descendants of Abraham, see, they thought, well, I'm a, I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm an Israelite, so I'm, all, I'm already good with God. I'm a child of God. That's what they were thinking, and he cuts right to that. He says, don't even try and come to me telling me I'm a child of Abraham. God could turn these stones into children of Abraham if he wanted to. You know, that same mindset is actually very prevalent today in our culture. Did you know that? It really is, especially here in the South. Many, many people, and I actually used to be one of them, used to say, well, I'm a Christian. Why are you a Christian? Well, my mom and daddy are Christian. My grandparents are Christian. I was raised in a Christian home. I went to a Christian school, so therefore, I'm a Christian. But friends, again, none of that makes you a Christian. None of that makes you a Christian. That doesn't make you any more a Christian than standing in a car lot going, I'm standing in a car lot in this parking space, so I must be a sports car. And we laugh, but it's the same thing. You can come and sit in church every Sunday, but that's no, that's not, that doesn't make you a Christian. It makes me a Christian no more than if I go to a donut shop. It does not make me automatically a police officer. 
<laughs> but look at John, just kidding. But, uh, but look at John's words. Look, look at John's words in, in verses 8 and 9. He's saying that we will and we must bear fruit worthy of repentance. We have to. And again, it's not what we believe, but, but, but it's what we do with that belief. And he gives examples. How, how can I show that I'm really a Christian? He's saying, love people. If you see somebody without a shirt and you got two, give them one. Somebody's hungry, feed them. Your actions, your actions will prove that you're a Christian. Turn back to James again, James chapter 2. Look at verses 21 to 26 as we close out James. He says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? He says, Do you see faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. It was proved. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So you see then that a, a man is justified by works and not by faith only. You know, God, in Genesis 22, we're familiar with this. In Genesis 22, God told Abraham, he said, listen, Abraham, you have your son Isaac. He's the promised son. But, and, and through this son, we're going to make a, you're going to have a mighty nation. There, you'll have so many descendants, it, it, you won't even be able to count them. It'll be like the sands of the seashore, Abraham. And then we come to chapter 22 of, of Genesis, and God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I want you to take your son Isaac. I want you to take him, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Imagine what Abraham's probably thinking. Wait, 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 what? You want me to do what? But Abraham, it says in chapter 22, he took him to the top of Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is what it says. Now today, Mount Moriah is what's, it's in Jerusalem. It's what's known as the Temple Mount. So if you see the Dome of the Rock, that big mosque that, 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 uh, that, that Islam, that, that they have set up in there the Muslims have set up. That's on the top of the, of the Temple Mount. That's where Solomon had his temple. And the neat thing about this is that that temple, they believe, the Jews as well uh, as uh, the Muslims believe, that right where it's sitting is over the exact spot where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. But they also believe that it's on the exact spot where God created Adam. Kind of interesting. It's that same spot. So they believe that where... God told Abraham to take Isaac. That's not only where God created Adam, the first man, but now he wants him to sacrifice his only son. Isaac, again, was the promised one. This mighty nation would come from him. And yet God instructs him, take Isaac, offer him as a sacrifice to the Lord, a burnt offering. Abraham, though, he believed in the promise of God. He says, you know what, God? I know that you promised me this through Isaac, I know you promised me. I know that you keep your word. You don't lie. And so I'm going to do what you want me to do. And so by faith, he takes him, his only son, and, and he knew that, that God is still going to keep his promise no matter what. So even if he was to sacrifice and kill Isaac, he believed somehow maybe he would resurrect Isaac. He didn't know. He didn't know what God was going to do. But he said, God, I trust you. So Abraham obeyed God. He took Isaac to Mount Moriah. And then when Isaac asked his father, he said, Father, you know, we got the wood. We got the, we got the, we got the, uh, uh, we're, we're going to do the offering. We have the altar, but where's the sacrifice? Where's the sacrifice? You remember what Abraham said? He looked at him and said, my son, God, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering. And as Isaac was bound, he tied his son up and he laid him on top of the altar. And as he pulled out the knife and he was getting ready to slash his son's throat, it says, The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And that's important because anytime a name is repeated twice, that means what? They were in a relationship together. That's why people, whenever they come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, professing relationship, he says, I never knew you. We never had a relationship. But he says, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the lad. Don't do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And friends, we know now, because we have God's complete revelation, we have the Bible, that this account was actually a foreshadowing of when God the Father would not 
hold back his hand when he offered his only son, Jesus, on the cross for the sacrifice of sin. And so verse 23, the, the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and was accounted for his righteousness and he was called a friend of God. But then James wants to give us another example of another act of saving faith. Look at verse 25 of James 2. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? That's in Joshua chapter 2 where we see a harlot, we see a prostitute, somebody that everybody else would reject and they would look not what you want to look at and they would talk about behind her back. And, oh, there's Rahab. They would say these things. But yet he says, was Rahab the harlot, the prostitute? She believed that the Lord, the Lord had revealed to her that he had given their land to the Israelites. She believed it, she knew it, and so what did she do? She acted on that faith. She actually took her life into her own hands and she said, you know what, I'm going to risk my life, I'm going to hide you, I'm going to hide you. Because they were looking for these spies. And so she took them to the top of the roof and she hid them under flats and she hid them. And the, and the guards asked her, bring those men out. She said, well, they were here, but they left, they went out another way. They could have killed her right then. They could have taken her, beat her, tortured her, killed her. They could have done that. Killed her whole family. But she acted on faith. She told the spies, if only remember me, show me kindness, show me mercy whenever you come in to destroy Jericho. And because of her faith and her work, she could have believed it. She could have said, I know the land is yours and I know that you're going to come in and destroy everything. I'm not going to do anything about it. She would have been swept away and killed with everybody else. But because she acted on her faith, she was saved from the coming destruction. Not only she, but her family as well. So had she not acted on her faith, she and her kin would have been destroyed with everybody else in Jericho that day when the walls fell. And so James closes out chapter 2 with verse number 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So again, it's not what you believe, but it's what you do with that belief. If we think of it in terms of a tree, our faith is the root. Good works are the fruits. And we have to have both. We have to have the root and the fruit. Good works alone will not save. A faith without the evidence of good works will not save. We can profess faith, but our actions, our words, our works will reveal our heart. And our mind. And our heart and our mind have, we have to see if they've been truly changed. And they have to be truly changed. As James noted in 1, 17 to 18, where he said that a true faith is actually a gift from God. Remember he said all good gifts come down from the Father of lights. So true faith is a gift from God and it can only be given by God. It's not something you can create in yourself. You can't just believe yourself. It is God who draws you to Him. And it's God who saves you. And it is God alone who creates in you a new heart and a new mind. And if He is the one who does the work in you, it will be evident. If you're just trying to do it on your own, that will be evident too. Because you won't bear fruit. But if God is doing it, it will be evident in all that you say and do. It will stick. It will last. You will not fall away. You'll be changed. I want to close with this analogy from Paul Washer. He said this, he said, if I was late getting to church today, and you asked me, you said, Pastor, why are you, why are you a half hour late getting here? What would you think of me if I said to you, well, it's the most amazing thing. I was driving down the road, and I had a flat tire. And so I pulled off the side of the road. And as I got off on the side of the road, I was going to take the tire off. And when I did, I reached over for the spare. And the spare, I hit it. I had it set up. And it rolled out into the middle of the road. And so I put down the wrench, and I walked over there. And, and as I was picking up that spare tire, I looked up, and here was a two-ton logging truck. And it hit me head on. And it knocked me across the road. So I got up, dust myself off, and now I'm here at church today. What would you think of that pastor? Are you trying to tell me a two-ton logging truck hit you as a person and you're not even dirty, you have no scratches on you? That wouldn't be very believable, would it? But yet, people will say they have had that same kind of interaction with a holy God and they've not been changed at all. There's no evidence of that. And yet, a God who created the earth created the logs on that two-ton truck. And they'll say, I had an experience with God. He hit me head on and He changed me and I'm a Christian now. 
And yet there's no marks. There's no nothing to show that. So are you bearing fruit worthy of repentance? Remember what John the Baptist warned. The axe is laid to the root. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Father, we thank you that your word instructs us, it encourages us, but Lord, it also can convict us. Lord, your word is a mirror for us to look into because there's nothing hidden from your eyes. And so, Father, today we thank you for the word that you have given us. We pray that we'll have learned something today, all of us, myself included, Lord. And Father, today we pray that we are all be changed by your grace and your mercy. We pray, Lord, for a new heart, a new mind. Help us to bear fruit worthy of repentance because we know, as John said, the axe is laid to the root. And those who do not bear fruit, Lord, you say you will cut away and toss into the fire. So, Lord, may you do the work. We can't do it in ourselves. But we know that if you do it, it will last and we will be changed. And so, Father, we thank you today. We praise you today. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.